This podcast is sponsored by Fastly. Fastly CDN, WAF, Load Balancer, and Image Optimizer were built by developers for developers to deliver sites and applications quickly and securely. We integrate seamlessly with your existing stack and workflows for increased insight and control. Test up to $50 of traffic for free at fastly.com forward slash sign up. My name is Wes Rice, and I'm the chair of the English-speaking QCon software conferences in London, San Francisco, and New York. Today, we're talking with Sachin Kokarni. Sachin is a director of engineering at Facebook. At Facebook, he has worked on some extremely well-known systems with incredible scale, including video infrastructure, where he's built and scaled the entire backend that powers Facebook Live, where he's re-architected the backend for Facebook videos to help ensure more reliable video uploads, real-time video encoding, and more. He's also worked on real-time infrastructure and the messenger backend. In today's podcast, we talk about the engineering challenges around Facebook Live, including diving into the ingestion, processing, and stream challenges with the platform. Then we explore some of the differences between Live and the video upload platform at Facebook. Finally, we wrap with a discussion on things that Facebook is doing around the video or the distributed video encoding platform, including how they're using something called AI encoding to achieve 20% smaller files than the already small native H.264. Great podcast. I hope you enjoy it. All right, Sachin, thank you for joining us on the InfoQ podcast. My pleasure. Thank you, Wesley. So you work in a group that is Facebook infrastructure. Can you tell us a bit about the types of projects that uh, you manage there? Absolutely. So uh, I currently work on Facebook Messenger, Facebook Live, and Facebook Videos. But Facebook infrastructure powers the broad family of apps, uh, including the Facebook app, Messenger, Instagram, and so on. And so the infrastructure is a much broader organization that is responsible for storage, caching, pub sub, uh, monitoring, analytics, data warehouses, streaming, etc. We also build our own data centers and so on. And we work very closely with product teams to build services and platforms that can be leveraged in building products quickly. Within the video infra team, we are responsible to build the foundation for video products across the company. What are some of the uh, video projects that Facebook manages? Obviously, Facebook Live is, is well known, but what are some of the other ones in addition to that you manage? There is a distributed video encoding platform that we build. Uh, this is a platform to encode videos in a distributed fashion which results in low latency encoding and does a better user experience. The other one is video uploads and live ingest, both of them, where we build common libraries for fast and reliable uploads. The key here is we want to have video quality as high as possible. And so building these libraries is hard enough that we try to build them once and use them across multiple apps. A completely different angle of working on this is a video clustering, where we can cluster uh, similar videos together, which results yeah. in better ranking. And so when you see related videos, you know which ones are related using this clustering. Oh, interesting. So those are some of the examples. So well, let's talk about, you just mentioned two things, ingest and video encoding. How, how are those two things different? So uh, the ingest is more about moving the bytes from the client apps into Facebook data center. Okay. And so this can include chunking, uh, encoding on the phone, and so on. Uh, while processing or encoding is more of a server-side activity, I see. where once the bytes are there, we do something with them to uh, keep the quality higher, but fewer bits and so on. So that brings up an interesting point about server-side versus client-side. So when you're talking something, a product like Facebook Live, a lot of that encoding is actually handled by the client. So that way you can take advantage of the client for some of the processing? Uh, we actually do encoding on both client and the server for Facebook Live. Okay. Um, where if you're uploading a video, it's solely server-side? There we can make a choice whether we want to do it on the client side as well. Uh, it depends on the network conditions, the type of phone, and so on. So can you talk more about that? What's the trade-off when you have to make a decision between doing encoding on the client versus server-side? So the trade-off there is uh, mostly about the quality of video versus latency and reliability. Yeah. And so if you're in a very good networking conditions and your phone uh, can support encoding, then we will try to maintain as high a quality as possible. Because you can encode the, if you encode the bytes, there is definitely some loss. Because all encodings are typically lossy. And so we try to upload the video in as high a quality as possible. But if the network condition is not good, then it makes sense to encode the video, use fewer bits when we transport it over the, uh, over the network. Uh, in this case, the latency and reliability will be reasonable, but the quality may be slightly off. So those decisions are made uh, on a per upload basis. And that's based on the network and the actual device that they're using. Yes. Okay. When you and I talked before, you mentioned, or, or in one of your talks I saw, 
that there are 1.28 billion daily users that use Facebook. So what are some of the unique challenges when you're talking about that kind of scale when it comes to video? Yes. So uh, 1.28 billion users accessing Facebook each day is a lot. I mean, the scale is just tremendous. The world has about 7 billion people. And out of that, a large person don't have access to the internet. And so the folks that are online, a very large person use Facebook each day. So the scale is tremendous and it's a huge responsibility. One way to uh, wrap your head around all of this is thinking about race conditions. Race condition as in a sequence of events that cause a bug or unknown behavior to happen that's kind of rare? Yes. So uh, we all know race conditions happen in a small percent of cases, let's say 0.01% of the time or for 0.01% of requests. But when you have 1.28 billion people submitting multiple requests to the backend infrastructure, this results in millions, uh, the race condition being hit millions of times. To manage this well, we have to think through a lot of these race conditions ahead of time and build the solutions into the design. If this is an afterthought, then it will fail uh, way too many times in production, resulting in a lot of time spent uh, by the on-call in trying to fix those issues. Yeah, but these are one in a million type problems. How do you even begin to rationalize and try to think through a problem that happens one in a million times? There are uh, multiple ways of doing this. We usually launch everything on an experiment basis. And so we launch it for okay. uh, our internal users or employees first shadow mode, and then we can put some shadow load on it to uh, load test it a bit. That will showcase some of the initial race conditions that we can work around. Then we start launching it to users 0.1% at a time, then point, uh, then 1%, 5%, and so on. And so with each increase in load, we get to see more and more of these race conditions that we can fix before we roll out further. How long is it, if you roll out something like Facebook Live, how long does it take to go from your internal users all the way out to say fully deployed with 100% of Facebook users? These days for our backend systems, we typically do a yeah. weekly release. So each week we push out a new version of the backend software and go through those motions. So in that week time span, you go from a canary with just Facebook internal users out to full load with 1.28 billion users? Yes. So you have to excuse me, it's kind of hard for me to get my mind around that. What does it look like? to go from just a handful of users all the way up to that kind of scale? What's that process look like for Facebook? Uh, so a large part of that process is automated. So we definitely okay. have canaries and we have dev tiers and shadow tiers and so on. And so right. at each step, we have uh, a lot of monitoring in place and then alerts on those, uh, on those metrics. So if something looks off, uh, alerts get fired and we know something is wrong. And then we stop the rollout further. We go look at the issue, fix the issue, and then continue the rollout. So what's the process look like as you validate along the way? Right. So let's say I'm, I've rolled out a new version of the software to 1% of users. Right. The remaining 90, 99% are still on the old version. And so I can compare the metrics across those two groups. And then if the metrics look significantly off in a bad way, then I know something is wrong with the new version. Makes sense. And so then I can fix that. Awesome. Okay, so let's talk about um, a, a bit about Facebook Live, for example. So uh, just to kind of recap, Facebook Live is the point where you can take your phone out and you can record a live stream, and that's out in uh, on Facebook literally within within seconds of it being recorded, right? Yes, absolutely. So uh, this is a broad live streaming platform open to all users. And as soon as people go live, we send it out uh, to the viewers. And so people will see it in their feed that this person is going live, either your friend or this person could be a celebrity you follow or a page that you follow and so on. And so they can start viewing the live stream as it is happening. I guess one of the big questions I have about that when you go live is, is how do you deal with just, I guess, the inherent latency of streaming live video directly from a device like your phone? Oh, so uh, the latency actually depends a lot on uh, where the broadcaster is, where the viewer is, and the network conditions at both of those places. Sure. So uh, if I'm going live from here, let's say in the US, and the viewer is, let's say, in India, then there is just the physics of the bits traveling over the network uh, that adds some latency. There is also latency added by uh, when you want to encode for uh, network conditions that may not be excellent, because you need to send fewer bits over the wire, and so that encoding requires some buffer. And then there is also a buffer on the players uh, to enable a smooth experience. And so all of these latencies add up. But generally, we try to keep it in single digits latency. So we're talking latency measured in seconds for live video. That's great. Speak, speaking of live video, how did this even come about? I mean, the whole idea of taking out your phone and streaming live video like this was a pretty new concept. Where, where did the idea come from? How did it? How was it created there at Facebook? 
Yeah, so there's an interesting story on that. Like a lot of projects at Facebook, this came about in a hackathon. So this was a Hackathon 49 in April 2015. And the name of the hackathon was Hack Under the Stars because it was held on the rooftop garden on Facebook's campus in Menlo Park. And so uh, hackathon is generally a forum uh, that is very widely used at Facebook where people from different teams and disciplines can come together to build something new and creative. And so in this case, we wanted to build the Facebook Live infrastructure. And so a few engineers, a production engineer, a TPM, we came together. It was a small group. And by end of the hackathon, we had a working prototype of the live streaming infra. Cool. So that is how it started. The, the path from there to production was pretty quick, but we can talk about that after if you want. Oh, very cool. So in that span of that hackathon that you did, what was uh, what was your first prototype that you got? Uh, you were able to stream? <laughs> so uh, the first thing that we streamed uh, was the clock. Now yeah. one may imagine it would be something interesting, but no, we were trying to use the clock to measure the end-to-end -end latency of the system. We yeah. are pretty nerdy that way. So we were like, you know what? The first one has to be the clock. So we measure the latency. And so it was like 10 or 3 PM. And the initial latency was super low because we were sitting right next to each other with excellent network conditions and so on. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was a clock. We remember that live stream. So you streamed a clock at first. Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, OK, so from that point of hackathon all the way out, all the way out to 1.28 billion uh, daily users, what was that path to production? What did that look like? So uh, after April, we kept working on productionizing our uh, streaming infrastructure. And by August, we had launched live to public profiles that use the mentions wow. app. And so this was like within three to four months, it was launched. Uh, there were hundreds of really interesting and memorable broadcasts uh, that these public profiles did. And that led us to believe that this could be a very useful product for all our users. And yeah, so sure. we took some more time to scale this and then launch it to all our users in December. And so from April to December, it was like in eight months, it was out to all users on iOS, Android, and also browsers. So how is that possible? I mean, just that short few months being able to do that, is that because you were able to leverage some of the, the things you had learned about encoding with video already? Or how in, how in the world were you able to achieve this? Right. So uh, we definitely stand on uh, shoulders of giants here. Sure. So for example, we don't have to revisit what the storage system should look like. We already have a very solid blob storage system called Everstore. Uh, we could rely on open source software like Nginx uh, for actually doing the encoding and processing the live stream. Mm. So we could reuse a lot of work that was done in the industry as well as a bunch of work happened within the company itself that we could reuse and build this out. How much of the stack are things that you've built versus how much was, say, open source? So uh, we started off using uh, Nginx for uh, right. the live processing, which is open source. The storage system uh, was built internally at Facebook. We call it Everstore. Uh, the mm -hmm. business logic is all custom for Facebook. Uh, so that is all built by us. And then the apps and the client libraries are pretty much all built by us. So there is a mix of open source and our own stuff. What is the software stack that most of this is built in? Facebook infrastructure is largely a C++ shop. We do have I some imagine. Java, some Python. And the business logic is all in PHP. And then the apps, uh, iOS apps are in Objective-C, and uh, Android apps are in Java. Very cool. OK, well, let's, uh, let's start talking about a specific, uh, I guess, Facebook Live and talk specifically about maybe its architecture and how you handle that. OK. So uh, this is going to be tough without a whiteboard, of course. But you know, for the whiteboard of our minds, it's the phrase I tend to use when I do these podcasts. Can you draw out the big blocks of the architecture of what uh, Facebook Live kind of looks like? Yes, absolutely. It all starts with the broadcast client. This could be the Android app, or the iOS app, or the dedicated mentions app. Or we also have a live API uh, that professionals can use with their own encoders. Okay. And so the first block is the broadcast client. On that client, we have our client libraries that do a lot of uh, packaging, uh, encoding, and so on. From there, it hits a geographically local pop uh, where the stream gets sent. The connection gets terminated on that pop. We use RTMPS, a real-time messaging protocol uh, that is secure for this purpose. From that point on, the connection is forwarded over our internal network to a Facebook data center. So that becomes the next block. Mm -hmm. And in the Facebook data center, there is a, this stream hits an encoding host. The encoding host is responsible to actually encode the stream into multiple formats and then package it into uh, RTMP or Dash. So the next block after that is our CDN, where uh, this stream will then get cached. 
And then the last block is the player, where the viewer is actually seeing the live stream in action. Right. And so there are player libraries on the player side as well. So those are uh, sort of the linear blocks from left to right, if I will. Uh, with the broadcaster is on the left and the uh, viewer is on the right. How do you, when you're talking the kind of traffic that you were talking earlier about um, at Facebook with like 1.28 billion users, how do you, I guess, coalesce that traffic? How do you, how do you merge this traffic together at each stage as it goes through so that you're not just um, having a thundering herd going all the way back to your, uh, to your backend systems? Users could be broadcasting from anywhere in the world. And so they hit their local, geographically local pop. So we have a lower uh, round trip time. And right. so there is a scaling factor right there where you can hit different pops. And then from there, it goes to a data center. What about load balancing at that point? One of the key things that we use for load balancing is hashing based on the stream ID. Okay. So every time you go live, you create, you make a request that is out of band to create a stream ID. And you get back a stream ID from the server. You also get back a URI that you can use. Uh, for publishing the stream. Okay. And so internally, we hash based on that stream ID. So we can do a load balancing within our data centers and map the stream to different data centers. And so that's how the scaling works. And so we can use capacity across the world and not just route all the requests to one data center, right. which can get overloaded. Okay, if you're using capacity all across the world, how do you deal with things that, that are bound to happen, just like bad networking? How do you deal with those kind of situations? We have client libraries that optimize live in these libraries work across iOS and Android. And the first thing that they do is figure out the video bitrate for video encoder based on the network conditions. So they run a speed test to check okay. what the bandwidth is right now. And they figure out the bitrate uh, to be used for encoding. Once we know the bitrate, uh, the library takes uncompressed bit streams from the phone and encodes them using H.264 and AAC, which are the standard codecs for video and audio. And then it wraps the compressed frames in the RTMP compatible format. And then these packets get sent out over to the server. The interesting thing, though, is network bandwidth is not a static thing. Right. It keeps changing during the broadcast. Sure. And so it, it is definitely possible that you measure the bitrate, and then you realize that, oh, during the live stream, the bandwidth just went down significantly. And so there is a choice to be made. So we use something called adaptive bitrate where if we realize we can't really push these bytes out uh, quickly enough, then we reduce the bitrate further. Right. This results in a lower quality, but the stream will continue. How does that work with adaptive bitrate? I mean, is that something that is some kind of feedback signal that's coming back? Or how, how do you actually know that you need to reduce the bitrate? As we are sending these packets out, we get acts back from the server okay. when it has received it. And so we know the latency and we know how much we can push through. Right. And so then if we realize it is lower, then we lower the bitrate. And then at some point, the bandwidth may go back to what it was originally, and then we can increase the bitrate again. And so we change the bitrate on the fly, depending on the network bandwidth conditions. Okay, so that's ingest of live streams. Once this stream shows up at the data center, how is it processed? What actually happens at that point? Uh, so once the ingested stream shows up at a data center, we allocate a particular encoding host to deal with that stream. And this is based on the uh, consistent hashing of the stream ID. Right. And so once we know that host, that host does five different things. The first is it checks uh, and authenticates the stream to make sure everything is correct and permitted. Uh, this is important so we don't allow uh, random things like uh, unauth unauthenticated streams into our uh, data in, into our system. The right. second is the stream is associated with this particular host, and we map that logic out so anybody who wants to play the stream knows that they have to go to this host. The third thing that occurs is we create various encodings for the stream. So if somebody is in a network condition which is not optimal, then we need to create an encoding that uses fewer bits. Mm. That would typically also mean a lower quality, but it is better to have a smooth experience than to have right. a high quality that keeps buffering all the time. So this is where earlier you were talking about the player being able to pick different encodings based on um, the network conditions that it needs. Yes. I see. The fourth thing that happens there is creating Dash and the RTMP stream, which is the packaging around the encoded stream. And then the last thing that happens is uh, we actually store this live stream for video generation later on. So one of the unique things about Facebook Live Video is these live streams are recorded and converted into normal Facebook videos at the end of the stream so that these streams can be replayed or shared by people later on. Now, right. if the user chooses to delete the stream, then we will delete it. But if you choose not to delete it, then people can see it after the fact as well. If we try to have the video, the experience of watching a previously recorded live stream, 
to be as close as possible to the actual live stream. So you will see the comments uh, appearing in real time. You'll see the reactions appearing in real time. Uh, so it, it's almost the same experience. Very interesting. Okay, so then what do you use to actually stream that live feed out to the end user? Okay, so for uh, streaming this live stream out, we use uh, MPEG Dash. Okay. Dash is a format uh, that allows streaming media over HTTP. And so it has uh, two types of files. One is the manifest file, which you can think of as an index, which points to all the actual media files. The second type is the media files. So for a given live stream, the server creates separate media files for, let's say, each second of the live stream. Okay. And so once you put all of these one second uh, media files together, you get the full stream. The manifest is just an index to point to all of that. So you can say, give me the 30th second, and then the manifest will point you to the right URI of the media file, which you can go fetch. Okay, so I'm watching my feed, and I see that a friend of mine is just about to go live or is going live with um, Facebook Live. How do you leverage the MPEG dash to be able to deliver that video stream to me? When you see a live stream in your feed or you get a notification and you click on it, the player will go and request the manifest, uh, the player on your phone. And so if the manifest has not been requested from your local pop before, then the request goes back to the data center to fetch the manifest. Uh -huh. And then the manifest gets sent down to the player. And the player says, OK, I, I want the current media stream now. And it uses the URI to go request that. If this URI has not been requested before from the player's pop, then it goes back to the data center and fetches that. Right. Once all, both of these, the manifest and the media files are fetched from the data center, they get cached in that pop. OK, so new users then coming in to request the same video or requesting the same files from cache. Yes. So anybody else who wants to view this that hits that pop will get access to it right away without having to go back to the data center. Sure. OK, that makes sense. Now, once the, your player has the manifest and the media file, it can start playing it right away. Okay. And as the live stream goes on, newer media segments get generated, and the manifest gets updated according to point to the new media segment. Those get populated, and we can use either a pull mechanism from the pop or a push mechanism to push out all these updates to the pop. And so from there, you keep getting the new updates, the new media files, and you can keep watching the entire stream without having to worry about fetching all of this yourself. Interesting. So I guess in, in that type of metaphor, you don't have to keep worrying about refreshing the cache because that's kind of, it's history that happened. So that you don't have to worry about that. Is that accurate? Yes, that is correct. Because the okay. uh, we could use a push mechanism where the data center will push out that the manifest has been updated uh, right. out to the pop. That makes sense. OK, very cool. These MPEG dash players that you're using, are these something that, that you built custom? Or are these something that's an open source solution that you're leveraging within the Facebook app? So we have to have uh, our own players and our own logic to play that. But MPEG dash is an open standard. And so there are players out there in the industry that you can use. But for Facebook at our scale, we need to have a lot of fixes in the right uh, software. So we build our own players. Very nice. I want to ask some questions about, um, I guess, the video side um, as well here in just a second. But um, I want to circle back for just a minute. And when you talked about the geo pops that these things are connecting to that are kind of distributed, how does the video get distributed from pop to pop, or does it? So when you come down and you, you cache this manifest file and everything that's going to be fed back, do you have some mechanism that, that transfers that from each of these geo pops? Or is it just when the first request comes in through that pop that it caches it? How does that work? Uh, so the pops talk to the data center to fetch the right manifest files uh, depending on uh, what people are requesting. Right. And so if there is a localized live stream, let's say somebody in Thailand is broadcasting something, and nobody in the US has asked for this, then the relevant pops closer to the US may not really have the manifest file for that stream at all. So it's just when the first, when the request comes through that particular pop is then when it gets cached? Yes. OK. What you just described was the ingest processing and streaming for Facebook Live. When you were first discussing Facebook Infra earlier, you sort of made a distinction between Facebook Live and video upload. How does this problem kind of evolve as the use case changes from live to video upload? Right, uh, that's a great question. So one of the key restrictions or the challenge I would say with live is you cannot batch this workload. It is real right. time, it has to happen now. People are watching it now and so it is almost like making an interactive uh, web request where you're not gonna wait for a minute to uh, get the response back. You want it right, right. away. And so live makes uh, has this additional challenge that normal videos don't. When you're uploading a video, depending on how long the video is, people are willing to wait uh, for some time for the video to get uploaded and then show up in people's feeds. 
so we can batch the workload for videos much better. Right. And so throughput can be much higher, uh, even though latency can also be higher. With live, latency has to be low, and everything else is secondary. Facebook Live isn't the only place you're innovating with video. You were also telling me a bit earlier about some interesting things you're doing with distributed video encoding for upload. Would you mind recapping a bit about what you were telling me earlier? Absolutely. So uh, the key requirements for building a stable and scalable distributed video encoding platform are fourfold. It clearly needs to be fast. It right. needs to be flexible. Uh, it needs to be robust to spikes, because we get spikes with videos all the time. And it has to be very efficient. And so uh, at a high level, you can think of this as the client library takes a video and breaks it up into smaller chunks. Uh, a chunk may correspond to GOPs, which is groups of pictures, which is roughly equivalent to a scene in a video. Mm. And so as it breaks up those, uh, the video into these GOPs or chunks, it sends out those chunks in parallel to the server side. On the server side, a, a process called preprocessor receives these chunks. And the preprocessor is a write through cache. So as soon as it receives uh, these segments, it writes them to our uh, blob store, and it also starts encoding them using the scheduler. Hmm. The scheduler keeps encoding these in parallel as the segments are arriving and creates multiple encodings for these files. And so we, we figured out that compared to serial processing, we can get about a 10x speed up in processing latency by using distributed processing. So that was a huge speed up. The other thing that we realized is we also want to make sure we are being efficient with using bit rates uh, because this affects people's data plans. Right. And so that is where uh, AI encoding comes in. So what we realized is for creating smaller files with the same or high quality without using an exorbitant amount of CPU is actually a pretty hard problem. This is largely because modern encoders have so many knobs that the combinations of encoding settings quickly get out of hand. Right. To give you one, uh, one example of numbers here, if we are given 100 to find the optimal settings for a video, then we will have 1 in a 15 billion chance to actually get the right settings. 1 in a 15 billion chance. The odds are basically worse than winning the Powerball. And so yeah. the odds are kind of crazy there. Uh, and so this is where AI encoding comes in, where the key insight is each video is different, and those encoding settings should be customized per video. And even within a video, each scene can be substantially different. So you could have a fast moving sports scene, or you could have talking heads uh, where there isn't much movement. Or you could have a complex scene where a lot of people are walking and there could be a lot going on. And so each scene can be compressed using different settings. And so that is where AI encoding comes in, where we create a large training set and create a neural network model. And so offline, we train. Uh, we use a training set to train the network model. And online, we use a neural network model to come up with the right settings. Oh, nice. The input, yeah, the input video is segmented into smaller scenes. And the fingerprint is generated for each scene. And the fingerprints are fed into the neural network, which outputs the settings for each wow. scene. And so we can use these different uh, settings for each different scene. And as you can see, the distributed video encoding platform is made for a system like this, where it is already yeah. breaking up the video into chunks, and so you can use different settings for each of those chunks. That's really awesome. So what were the wins? What did you see as the results? So AI encoding actually gave us 20% smaller files than Naive H264. Oh, nice. And H264 has worked on in the industry for many years, so it has been optimized already. So 20% is nothing to sniff at. It's actually right. a significant win. Super interesting. So what are uh, what's some of the new things that you've launched recently with uh, with the platform? Right. So recently, we provided the ability uh, in Facebook Live to allow a broadcaster to invite people watching their stream to join the broadcast directly. So imagine the situation. Let's say your favorite celebrity is live. And you are a fan, and they invite you to talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. while the rest of the fans watching the stream are watching that interaction. And so you get to ask them questions uh, during the stream. So that requires a very interesting infrastructure. It's a very different challenge compared to normal life. Because yeah. in this case, two people talking, uh, the latency between them has to be in the order of hundreds of milliseconds. Right. It cannot be in order of seconds. You can't have a conversation when the latency is seconds. And so we had to build uh, significant parts of our infrastructure to work with this model. And then everything else after that follows the normal live streaming infrastructure, 
where the two people talk and everybody else can watch it as if it was uh, live. So what did you have to do differently to be able to support that kind of interaction in low latency? Uh, so for one, we used a different protocol called WebRTC, mm -hmm. uh, which is typically used for video calling, VoIP calling, and so on. Right, right. And so uh, we use that, and then the rest of the infrastructure is the same as before. But the two people use WebRTC to talk between them. Well, it sure sounds like you all have been really busy. I'm sure you've got some interesting stories of the things that uh, have really taken off on live. What uh, What's one of the more memorable, um, I guess, uh, engineering challenges you've had streamed out from Facebook Live? So uh, one of the key challenges that we see here is streams can become popular quickly right. without a heads up, right? For uh, some streams, like we have seen uh, the watermelon exploding stream from BuzzFeed. Uh, that was interesting. And so some of these streams, it is hard to predict ahead of time that they will become popular. And so when they become really hot, they strain many parts of the infrastructure in interesting ways. And because this is unpredictable, we can't really plan for this capacity ahead right. of time. So I think generally I say that unpredictability is the bane of engineering. Yeah. If you can't predict something, then it's super hard to sure. deal with it. And so those uh, streams that become popular, uh, without a heads up, uh, are the tricky ones. Well, Sachin, thank you for taking the time to chat with me. It was really great to get to learn more about the problem sets that you're solving with Facebook Video and Facebook Live. Thanks for chatting. Absolutely. Happy to help. I'm glad to be talking about all this awesome work we have done.